Welcome everyone to today's webcast. We'll be getting started in just about two minutes, so sit tight and we'll be starting momentarily. Once again, welcome everybody to today's webcast. We're going to be getting started in literally about one minute. So hang tight and we'll be getting started. Welcome everyone to today's webcast today, how UBA and UAM help monitoring high-risk positions sponsored by Variato. I'm your host, Nick Cavalancia from Tech Evangelism. Before we get started, let's cover a couple of housekeeping details real quick. Uh, first off, today's webcast is being recorded, so expect an email in the next couple of days with a link to the recording if you'd like to share that with colleagues or friends. Today's slides, as well as a number of other resources, are available in the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel, so feel free to download those or at any time during today's presentation. And then lastly, we encourage you always to ask questions throughout the webinar. I already see some coming in even before the webinar started. That's fantastic. Make sure those keep coming in. We'll cover those questions at the end of today's presentation. Be sure to use the question section of the control panel to submit any questions that you have there. And then we've got two great speakers today. A bit later, you're going to hear from Jack Doyle. He's a senior sales engineer from Variato, and he's going to kind of talk about how today's topic applies to Variato's products, but first up is Derek Smith. Now, uh, you can kind of you know put your seatbelt on, hold on to your hats. Uh, Derek is the world definition of an overachiever. You, this is going to knock your socks off here. He's got 30 years in the security industry. He's a former government agent. He's a cybersecurity subject matter expert. He holds a variety of certifications: CSSP, CEH, CISO, Security Plus, and the list goes on and on. He has eight college degrees. Yes, I said that correctly. Eight college degrees. A published author, conference speaker, cybersecurity analyst for several international and local television news stations. He's a government program manager and more. <laughs> I always love that in your in your uh, bio there, Derek, and more, as if he hasn't already done enough. And you can follow him on Twitter at Derek, that's D-E-R-E-K, Derek A. Smith and the number one on Twitter there. So, Derek, having said all that, welcome to today's webcast and take it away. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, thank you all for attending. I love doing these, and I love that you take your time during the day to come out and do this. So today, we're going to talk about monitoring your high-risk positions in your organization. So, of course, there's a lot of different people that you want to monitor in an organization from your, let's just say, your janitor all the way up to your CEO. But today, we're focusing on monitoring those high-risk positions, those positions that the bad guy is going to really go after when he's trying to get your your information, your intellectual property, and things like that. So many of the security threats in organizations, you know, that our organizations, you, me, anyone else on this webinar face every day are usually technological in nature. And we know that. But at their core, basically they still are perpetrated by people. Things that happen in our daily lives at work happens from people doing them, okay? So this, reply, this applies regardless of whether the threat is a network exploit or the theft of your valuable intellectual property. And not all the threats are going to originate from outside your organization. 
often it's that trusted insider, that high risk valuable resource in your organization that pose the greatest risk. Um, further complicating things for us is the fact that an insider threat can originate from a variety of different situations in a variety of different areas. You know, some attacks are going to be malicious, perhaps from that greedy accountant you have working for you who sees an opportunity to steal your money or steal your company money, or even that disgruntled IT support rep who wants to go out and sabotage your computer systems for whatever reason he's unhappy with his job. But other threats can be due to, let's say, a willfully negligent employee who misuses, uh, I shouldn't say, I'm sorry, not willfully negligent, well, he may be willful, but basically he misuses work computer and he exposes sensitive customer data or, um, out to folks who shouldn't be looking at it. Or you have a distracted manager who's working a lot of different things and putting out fires and he unwittingly clicks on a phishing link in an email. Let me tell you, I did that not long ago. I'm a cyber professional, right? I, I evangelize about this stuff, but about three weeks ago, I got an email at work that says, someone put you in for a war at work. Click on it to see who did it. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know what, this is probably a trick. This is probably something I shouldn't, put, shouldn't um, click on. But what if somebody did put me in for a war? I really don't want to miss that. Now, I'm telling folks to do this every day, not to click on these type of things. I know not to do it, and guess what I did? What do you think I did? I clicked on it. And what do you think happened? A banner popped up saying, if this had been a real email, you know, you would have exposed your organization to whatever. It was a trick because not long before that, there had, there had been training, phishing training that was done. Everybody had to do this training, and now they were testing us, unbeknownst to me, and I fell for it as a cyber expert. So I'm telling you, this can happen to anybody, right? So in this, what we call uh, multi-layered or asymmetric security environment that we deal with these days, Security decision makers have to be effective at managing not just that te technological aspect that I talked about of risk, but the human element as well. Even more so, that human element is very important, and that's what we focus on. So failure to do this could result in harm to our enterprise's finances, to our people, our personnel, which is even more important, to all our assets, to our networks, and even more importantly, something that you usually don't count when you talk about losses, our reputation. Loss of reputation could cost us millions and millions of dollars. I'm going to talk about money later on and lost customers, but what, what about the reputation? That's going to cause me to lose even more customers. Now, um, since as far back as the mid-1990s, a lot of companies have responded to the rise of the cyber threats that we're seeing now with tools. They want to throw more technology out there. They have these tools out there to detect and analyze a lot of different adverse events, right? So initial solutions out there focus on endpoint devices like your laptop or you know your printer so people can print things out, whatever it may be. Then what happened is that in the early 2000s, um, it expanded. It expanded to detect threats across entire networks. Now we had IDSs and IPSs and firewalls and all this kind of stuff to do our job. But still technology. Technology was looking at things coming through, packages and what's in that package. Then came big data data analytics. That came around in the mid-2000s. And what they started doing was aggregating and correlating um, large volumes of threat information across networks and, de and devices. Now, I used to be a federal agent. I spent about 18 years as a federal agent in the government. And as an investigator, we used big data to data mine for criminal activity. We started seeing the value of this. If that person did that, perhaps this happened also or putting information together that, to, that alone didn't mean anything, but aggregated together led us to some big cases, right? So what they started doing was that this uh, bunch of different solutions came out to take advantage of this big data analytics. Um, usually something that we use called a security information and event management system. I'm going to call it SIM because I'm going to talk about it more. But those security information and event management systems are used a lot today. So those tools evolved considerably over the last 10 years or so, but they remain centered on doing a couple of different things. That's collecting and correlating network events that it, that it sees. So in response, the, the security analytics community, people like us, has started deploying a new generation of more sophisticated solutions known as user behavior analytics, or UBA for short is what I'm going to use um, as I go on. That's what I'm going to discuss with you today as I explain how you can monitor your high-risk positions within your organization. So this is going to be interesting. It's going to be fun.
Now, what is UBA, you might ask me? And I'm going to talk a lot about that uh, a little while later. But generally, it's primarily focused on human activity, human behavior, which I said is mainly the most important thing you need to be looking at. It's well suited for applications for detecting your cyber attackers and your inside threats. You see, a lot of folks look at what's coming into organization. They look at that outside um, cyber attack but they rarely, rarely look at the inside of threat. And guess what? Most outside attacks become inside of threats because once they get in, they escalate their privileges, they pretend to be you, and now we think they're supposed to be there. Now, these UBA solutions, what they do is they use a combination of analytic approaches, including rule-based and pattern matching and statistical methods and all this other science-y kind of stuff, <laughs> and in some cases, even supervised and unsupervised machine learning. And what it does is that it establishes a baseline of how people typically use networks and devices. And then it goes on to detect significant anomalies. Anomalies mean changes in that behavior and then send alerts to the security folks like you and me for further validation. So that source data for that user behavior analytics system is usually going to include some type of structured, structured data like the logs from the network activity we, we see, the SIM information and other devices that we have out there. Now Gartner is an is a agency, company, whatever, that does a lot of research. And they add that by ingesting unstructured information such as performance appraisals, travel records, social media activity, what people, your people are doing on social media. That can be extremely useful in helping you and me discover a lot of different risky user behavior. Not just what somebody is looking at on, a com on their computer at work, but, you know, like I said, where are they traveling to? How is their performance changing? That's going to provide a better historical context for us and for our, these products to make decisions. So focusing on user behavior is going to be a step forward for security analytics. Okay? And this is something that we really want to look at. Now, in just a little while, I'm going to tell you more about UBA and how it works. But for now, let's look at some statistics. Let's look at some case studies. Let's look, look at what's happening right now um, in this area and in, around um, insider threat. So um, most of the insiders we have, they're not nefarious by intent. You know, they're not trying to be bad. They're not trying to break into your computers, okay? Or there's not a lack of attention to cybersecurity that makes them the weakest link in the – well, I should say it is a, a lack of attention to cybersecurity that makes them weakest link in the security chain. I always say the biggest and most important thing we do is training people. And as you said, as I said, I even fell for a phishing uh, attempt not long ago, okay? So you know ransomware is a big thing out there, right? So let's use it as an example. Ransomware affects IT systems through the negligence of insiders clicking on email links like I did that seem innocuous, but they deliver some dangerous payloads to our computer, you know, and, and then it downloads or allow people to get access to our, 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 our um our computer and start to do bad things. Think about just in June, we had the one about WannaCry and another one called Paya that was in the paper. Okay, these are ransomware hacks. Um, these are the kind of things that people are doing now. Also, workplace investigations also need to determine if that worker had or has a malicious intent. So by looking at his entire behavior, we know was this an accident or was this somebody trying to be malicious? Now we also have these credential imposters, and these are individuals who come, who are actually sent out as agents to get employment within our company for the main purpose, the express purpose of infiltrating our company security and accessing our confidential um, information, our intellectual property. Now they come in, they seek out low-level jobs. They might be the janitor or receptionist or something like that, because they don't want to bring attention to themselves, right? They want to hide in plain sight. And while they're employed and working for you and me. What they're doing is accessing a lot of our digital assets, as many as possible, and covertly um, sending out that information or using it to swindle us or manipulate us or steal from us, you know, by any means that they can, or even to just escalate their system credentials once they get in there. Um, and think about this. Um, I work at some companies. I go in at night, and I see the cleaning people all over the place, and they're cleaning the building. What if you left your computer on that day, or even if you left your password, like some people do, under a desk or whatever? These people can be doing whatever they want to at night, and we never even know about it. Now, also, some of our insiders, the people we trust, even develop a bad attitude over time. 
And they, you know, even though they're a minority, they pose a significant risk to our organization because they intend to use their authorization access to access for criminal or malicious purposes. So here we have it um, with the numbers and my chart that I have here. Who are those individuals that's threatening the security of your IT system, your network, and your digital assets? Well, I have 62% of risk come from insiders. But let's break that down. If you look at my, my diagram on the side, only 38% of those threats come from attackers outside your organization. Okay, 38%. So that leaves 62% inside your organization. That remaining 62% come from, uh, from your employees, your contractors, other individuals that we have granted authorization credentials. We've allowed them into our system. Okay? If you look at it here, 2% come from that credentialed imposter that I talked about, those criminals posing inside our company as employees. 14% of those come from insiders with criminal malicious intent, people who intend to do us harm. And then 46% come from negligent insiders, employees and others who just make legitimate mistakes. But look at that number. 46% come from people just making mistakes. Okay? Let me um, talk a little bit more about insiders okay, and how to identify that before I go into this case study I have up. Let's talk about the indicators that reveal insiders at our workplace. So an insider threat might be present or developing over a period of time in your organization. And there's indications that can be categorized as two things um, from law enforcement. I call it direct or I call it indirect. Okay? And each one of those is going to require a different type of tracking mechanism, a different type of way for us to look at that threat. So let's talk about direct for a second. A direct risk uh, or direct risk indicators, and I say indicators because when I was a uh, fraud investigator, we look for fraud indicators. And these are things people were doing, I'm talking people were doing to indicate that they might be um, doing something bad. This is buying new cars, this is the expensive house, this is taking big trips and all that when they make 40 grand a year. Okay, doesn't make sense, right? So let's look at the, these direct risk indicators. They're usually abnormal activities that deviate from that person's day-to-day -day work activities. And examples might include downloading large volumes of data to external drives like Snowden did, or accessing sensitive inf information that has no direct relevance to their normal job duties, or even emailing confidential data to a personal account, something they should not be doing, right? They shouldn't put your information and send it to a personal account. Now, indirect risk indicators usually pattern, are, you know, are usually patterns of um, human behavior that require analysis to reveal some type of suspicious no motives. It's not just that car we see, or that house, or that trip. So examples of that include overuse of negative um, emotional words. You know, in electronic communications, they start sending out emails that's just negative, that's just down, right? Expressing desire to resign over social media. So you go out and check their social media account. Ah, I hate my job and I can't wait to quit this sucker. You know, something like that. Or um, expressing desire, uh, well, uh, demonstrating ties to high risk personnel or outside parties that they shouldn't be dealing with. Now, some other common threat indicators include these attempts to bypass your security controls. They shouldn't be doing that. Requests for clearance or higher level access without even needing that. You know, frequent access of workspace outside of their normal duty hours. If you see somebody coming in at 3 in the morning, that's probably a problem, okay? Um, irresponsible social media habits that I just mentioned. Use of unauthorized external storage devices. They bring in stuff in like Snowden did and plugging it in. Your system should be able to catch that kind of stuff. Decline in work performance is a good indication. And a whole list of other things, okay? Now, I'm going to say this. Those red flags alone, they shouldn't be um, deemed or looked at as demonstrates of, of harm in themselves, okay? Instead, what they should do is invoke the process of review and clarification. It should cause you and I to look at this and say something is wrong, okay? And we need to maybe um, uh, analyze this collectively in order to uncover some hidden relationships that might be there. So that's kind of what we're looking at with this whole user behavior analytic thing. As I said, I'll talk about that more in just a second. Let's go into a couple of case studies. This first one is payroll, your payroll employees as a high risk position. Because again, remember we talk about high risk. So your payroll personnel, for example, necessarily need access to employee social security numbers, right? They need your home addresses, they need your, your salary information, and so on and so forth. They need a lot of information about you. Now, information of this type, guess what, folks? It can easily be monetized. I can turn your social security into um, money. I can turn your credit card information into money. 
So as you see here, more than 43,000 former, former and current employees of um, a company, this particular company for this case study, is called um, Assisted Living Concepts, it's in Chicago, had their personal data stolen. It was compromised, including their social security numbers, their pay information, all that was exposed. And again, there's 43,600 current and former and current employees to be exact. And they took their names, addresses, birthdays, social security, and their pay information is what was stolen. And what happened was this, an unauthorized third party improperly obtained all the ALCs, that's what I'm going to use short for the company, payroll vendor credentials, just like Target. They use a vendor's credentials and use those credentials to access sensitive files in that vendor system. There it led to ALC being compromised. So ALC opened an investigation, and they're cooperating, as you see, with the FBI. And guess what? I work for the IRS and also us, the IRS, okay, um, to try to, to remedy this thing. Now, they took steps to prevent further unauthorized access to their payroll system, including going out and deactivating the credentials used by that third party. So they say, okay, the third party can't go anymore, so you at least can't get in through that same compromise that they used before. And they take their payroll systems offline until they were able to resolve the issue. Okay? Another important thing is that the vendor implemented a two-factor um, um, authentication for accessing their pay payroll records. If you don't know what that is, that means an ID and a password, a smart card and a password, something like that. And ALC notify all the impacted individuals and offer the one-year credit monitoring service for that. But think about the costs involved in all this. Okay. Now, how did, how did they find out about it? ALC was alerted by his payroll vendor on February 14th. Um, happy Valentine's Day to you. <laughs> so the payroll vendor said, hey, um, an author, authorized party has gained access to their system, their payroll system. And that unauthorized access was gained from December 14th to January 14th. So those people were in there for a whole month and wasn't even discovered until the month after that, February 14th. Okay? All right, so that's kind of the case study behind this particular one, using payroll as a high-risk um, position. Now, I have another one, the web manager, the person that takes care of your website. Okay? So consider the web content manager, whose regular job duties include uploading materials to your website. Uh, and, and some of these materials are intended for access only by certain individuals or intended to be accessed by the general public only after a specified date. Or it could be a system where you buy a product, and then you get access to that product after you pay. You go to PayPal and you pay. Not before, right? So early release of that material or release of unintended parties could produce some devastating financial um, losses or reputational damage to you or to your company. So in a recent security report, researchers found that an unsecured archive of U.S. voter data collected by what's called Deep Root Analytics, which is a data firm connected to the Republican National Convention, had a breach. Okay, full names and addresses and phone numbers of 198 million voters were compromised, were exposed anyway. It, uh, it was uncovered by security researchers in their um, internet accessible database with no password protection or any other security measures around this information. Anybody can basically go in and get this information and use it. Now, we don't know how long that data was exposed to the internet, but we know it was exposed. It doesn't take long. If I see it and I scrape it and I bring it in, I got the data. So that data was discovered um, by a researcher performing unrelated searches through Amazon's S3 infrastructure of that unprotected data. He found it, he went out there, he took a look at it, and he saw, hey, there's a problem here. All right, so he went out and reported it. Now, this data leak in particular was the result of that RNC, the Republic National Convention, failing to properly ensure the security of their data in the hands of a third-party contractor again. Okay, But again, that web manager had the trust to go out there and do these things, you know, for on behalf of the company, but it can cost the company um, money and it can cost them um, reputation. Okay. Now let's keep moving. Let's uh, a little bit more information for you. When we look at this privilege use and the security risk behind it, uh, I'm going to cover another study that's out there. Okay, the, um, this is a results of a study done between 2011 and 2014, and then they took data from insecurity of privileged users, and they, they um, compared it to present day and what's happening now. And what they found out was that 50% of IT operations and security managers believe their organizations are necessarily granting access to individuals 
beyond their roles and responsibilities. So you see it on the right hand side. They assign more privileges than needed to their organization. Uh, I always tell the story about me working at TSA as the ISSO, the Information System Security Officer. And the guy in charge, the senior executive in charge of TSA, had system admin privileges um, in his job. Now, this is not a cyber guy. This is not a security guy. He's not an IT guy. He, knows, he has no idea what that means. But wouldn't he be high profile? You go after him, you get his credentials, and guess what you have now? The keys to the kingdom. You have all the information you need to um, as, as sys admin, as a sys admin, to get into the systems. Continue on. 91% predicted the risk of insider threats will continue to grow or stay the same. Less than 40% agreed that malicious insiders. I'm reading this. I'm sorry. Malicious insiders will use social engineering to obtain privileged user access. Right. 70% of both groups think is very likely or likely that privileged users believe they're empowered to access all the information they can view. They think because they're a privileged user that they can read anything they want to read. Now remember, I work for IRS. IRS, it is against the law for us to look at your tax information. And if you look at the tax information, you could go to jail. If you remember not long ago, um, it was in the news, I could tell you this, that Obama's information was looked at by someone at the IRS. And that person went to prison for that. That is against the law. Okay. Um, and it goes on. Uh, but here's a significant number. 10% or less of IT security budgets are dedicated to addressing the significant challenge of insider threat. Only 10%. You put 90% of the money in looking at outside activity when all your money is going out the door due to inside activity. So what should we be focusing on? What should we be looking at? Let's continue on. Okay. Now, privileged users. What are they... Um, what are they privy to? What are they targets for? Sophisticated phishing scams. Now, I fell for one that wasn't that sophisticated, right? Somebody sent me an email and said, oh, Derek, you got something. And me being me, oh, I got something. Let me go see what it is. But 48%, as you see here, of external phishing scams are specifically targeted towards individuals in high-risk positions who have privileged system access. They're looking for those people, okay? And 40% of all malicious insider attacks target known individuals in high-risk positions to obtain their privileged access credentials clandestinely. They want to get them um, so they can escalate those privileges and do whatever they want to within your system. Now, what constitutes an insider threat? Let's take a look at insider threat and, and the different types of activity that you can run across. And there's a lot, but here's a little bit. First of all, malicious intent. It can be a ploy that we passed over for a promotion. They thought they should have got that promotion. They're upset, and now they want to take... They want to take it out on an organization. It could be a developer who insists on ownership of developed code. A lot of developers I work with, and I'm an IT program manager. I have a lot of developers working for me. And I have heard stories and seen in other organizations that those developers felt like, since I built this, I have some ownership rights to it. Well, I think we all know that if I build something on a company computer, using company assets, and doing it for the company, guess who it belongs to? The company. All right? So let's keep that in mind. Also, contractor who installs malware, like on a uh, point-of-sale system or whatever they may be installing malware on, they have malicious intent. We can also just be carelessness. You know, open email attachments like I did. I don't mind using myself as a bad example of what you shouldn't do. Okay? In certain unknown USBs, you know, we always do the test where you throw some USBs in the parking lot or on the floor, see how many people pick them up and put them into their computer. So inserting unknown or unauthorized USBs. Allowing other employees to have access to your credentials. Hey, man, why don't you go in and, you know, and I've seen this a lot. You know, they give you the password, you go in and make this change. Well, that's not a good thing. You know, one password, one user. And also using weak, easily guessed passwords. Or not even if it's not easily guessed, I can easily get to it um, by using something I can easily download from the Internet. We have privileged users. Now, these are the big guys. These are the guys that we're talking about with this high-level um, authorization and clearance. Okay? Now, they're not using um, malicious. There's no malicious intent you know, um, there. They might be quite loyal to the company uh, or their strategy or our future success. But the thing is, they're in a position of trust with the enterprise, and they have unfeathered access um, to sensitive cyber assets. Now, you're going to see them even make mistakes. Just because you're a sysadmin, I mean, you're a security guy. And I've seen sysadmins that have a user account and have a privilege account. And they'll go out to the internet and guess which account they use, that privilege account, because it gives them more access to something that might be closed off to them while they're at work. 
somebody get access to that and guess what they have they have sysadmin privileges sysadmin um, um, authority in your organization or your system all right so what constitutes an insider threat I told you some earlier on but basically uh, uh, atypical insider threat are from a cyber security perspective have these things again I talked about the unfettered access that they have to some of all your company assets you know that's that's a cause for concern Okay, these individuals are in what may be defined as high risk positions that I've been talking about. And it's possible that the access they have to that high value and critical access might be used in ways other than what we intended them to use it for. Okay, so they're trusted, and these trusted insiders might use their access to satisfy their curiosity. Like I said, IRS, I might want to say, hey, Obama or Trump, let me see how much money they make. Let me see what these guys have. You might not find Trumps. <laughs> right. Imposters may steal their authentication credentials. It may even be possible for these people to be placed under excessive duress, and somebody is threatening them to go out and find that information. Right? If you don't do it, I'm going to hurt your family, or I'm going to expose that you drink too much, or whatever it may be. And their privileged access can be leveraged by those attackers once they get it, such that that company could be made to suffer irreparable damage. You know, you can be brought down long enough where you can't stay in business. It can actually hurt your business. So these type of things can happen to you. All right. So again, they're high risk. They need access to sensitive information to do their job. They access to sensitive information is the root cause of insider threat. Okay. Intent is not the root cause of insider threat. Authenticated access to assets, access. Let me say that again. Access to assets is the root cause. You know, we can stop most breaches if we can stop access in the first place. Okay, once they're in, they're in. Then they're going to do all those nefarious things that they want to do. So, again, malicious intent is not the root. Authenticated access is the root. All right, so what, mo what are most companies doing to mitigate privileged user threats? Or, or privileged, yeah, user threats, I'll say that. They're doing things like deploying data loss prevention technologies. Now here's the thing, relatively high cost, we go out and buy SIMs, we buy all this stuff, firewalls, IDSs, IPSs, we throw technology at it. But look at what I have here, only provides a 10% return on your investment against threats by high-risk insiders. Okay? We do mandatory employee training, which is good, I really advocate that. But look at what I have here, training only lowers the annual cost of insider incidents by 7%. Okay, only effective in 27% of cases. Now, that's better than the technology, you know, training folks. But still, it only cuts your cost by 7%. Okay. All right, they perform background checks before issuing privileged credentials. It's a good thing. You want to see who you're hiring and get rid of them first. But what if they've never done anything? I, I guess a background check didn't, um, didn't show anything for Snowden. I worked at Booz Allen, and I know they do background checks and they follow up. But it didn't help if there's nothing out there to find, right? Increase the deployment of process for granting privileged credentials. Increase the use of commercial off-the-shelf access certification systems, privileged access systems like that. Business units assume credentialing responsibility. You know, they, uh, if I work for personnel or I work for uh, finance, I'm going to be a person in charge of giving credentials to those who need it. These are some things that they're doing, okay? Here are the results, though, okay? The results of tra these traditional methods that we're talking about. The impact of risk, the impact of risk actually increased 13% over five years. Okay? Use of traditional security tools to detect privileged user abuse makes it harder to detect insider misbehavior. Too many false positives. All this technology out there is going to alert us to all this stuff, and we're going to get false positives. And what's going to happen when you have false positives? Let me tell you a quick story. I used to be um, the deputy director for the Protective Service Division over the Defense Intelligence Agency, and we had a magnetometer. And when people got close to the magnetometer, it would go off all the time. I had four guards out there, four federal police officers out there bringing people in the morning. And it keep going off and keep going off. And one of the guys would reach out and they'd fine tune it. They'd turn it down a little bit so it wouldn't go off as often. And it'd still go off. And another one of the four guys walk up and he turned it down a little bit. And the next one and the next one. You see what I'm getting at here, right? Pretty soon they've turned it off and now you can walk through anything because it's turned down so far it won't even get anything at all. Okay, traditional security tools alone is not enough. Lack of organization-wide visibility hinders the ability to determine if insiders are compliant with policies. It says 70% of companies lack visibility into their employees. Average annual company costs for insider threats are around $4.3 million. This is for each time something happens. 
you know, and it can escalate. And again, I talked about reputation, loss of customers, loss of reputation equaling, equaling loss of customers can be even more detrimental to your company. We can't even count the loss. That this four point three million dollars probably just from credit services that you're going to give the person, and you know, and cleaning up your mess. It's not from the loss of customers. So in some cases, costs associated with insider threats can run into the hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, let me tell you, how many of you all out there listening can afford to lose that kind of money? It will wipe you out of business, right? So let's talk about some of the biggest challenges that companies face right now as far as um, establishing if an event is an insider threat, okay? And I'm going to talk about um, what we can do to help with that as also. Now, one of the most frequently cited errors that they talk about, that I talk about, companies make is failing to investigate after receiving a complaint of inappropriate behavior in the workplace. Somebody might say, Derek is doing this, or whomever, Nick is doing that, and we don't take a look at it. We don't take it seriously, okay? It makes no difference who that allegation is against. I don't care if it's a CEO, whether it's an employee, it's a supervisor, it's a manager, it's a vendor, even if it's a client. You know, you need to take a look at it. Now, the courts have upheld employees' right to a safe work environment first, and that work environment should be free from discrimination. We know that. Free from harassment, free from other negative content, um, particularly after um, notice of a wrongdoing has been given to the company. We have to be very careful. But we need to take a look. Okay, We need to pay attention. We need to see what's going out there what's going on in our organization. So sometimes our employees, they simply want to make the employer aware of an issue. Okay, They might say, Derek is doing something, you might want to keep your eye on it. But they specifically don't want to become entangled in that workplace invest investigation. They want, to, they want to be involved with, I told on Derek and he got fired or anything like that. But you need to take a look at it. Okay, um, There's an attorney out there who she cautions um, um, when she's representing employees in matters of employment law, even if that reporting employee refuses to cooperate with the investigation, the employer is legally obligated to still investigate. So we have to go out and do that. Okay. So I have here, not enough contextual information provided by security rules is a problem. Security to, I mean tools. Security tools yield too many false positives that I talked about. Behavior involved with the incident are consistent with the user's roles and responsibilities. What I mean is that we don't see an anomaly right now. It's consistent with what they should be doing so we don't notice it. Security tools yield more data that can be reviewed in a timely manner. One of the biggest problems we have is that people go out and we collect all this information, but because we're working every day, we don't have time to look at all this information. So what do we do? We set it aside. We don't take a big the, the look that we should take. Okay. So these are some of the things why our security fail to 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 um to to successfully battle the, the complex hacking operations and things like that that we that we run across. It's not due to lack of competency. It's not due to negligence so much as we might think. In reality, it's because our security um, teams out there, they lack context. I say not enough contextual information, right? They lack the context, you know, um, that they get, the, you know, from all the different alerts that they have. They get thousands of alerts that you don't even know about on a daily basis from all those various security tools that they have in there. And even the most sophisticated security teams that we have out there, they're not able to comprehend an attack because most security solutions lack the capability to produce cohesive alerts, telling the people what it is that they see. And I'm going to tell you this, a lot of people are not trained to actually interpret what they see. I used to work for Computer Network Defense at the Army Research Laboratory, and I learned that some of my people didn't know what they saw coming across those logs. Okay? So we have to make sure that they have the training that they need. All right? Here's some of the things I was talking about. So when we talk about contextual information, they, a lot of the tools focus only on individual events. They're not aggregating those events and putting those things together like they should be. Most security tools cannot produce cohesive alerts, as I mentioned. You know, what is it that I should be looking for? See, it's easy to see a package coming through and it has malware attached to it. But how easy is it, how easy is it for it to detect that Derek usually works from 9 to 5, but he's here Saturday at 3 o'clock in the morning? Why is Derek there? How can a tool easily do that without looking at behavioral analytics? You know, a SIM is not going to do that. A firewall is not going to do that. Security teams are going to remediate isolated issues without taking historical evidence into consideration. Remember I said I was a law enforcement guy, right? We did data mining. If I look at the individual data, I might not know I have a crime. When I start looking at this guy hanging out at 3 in the morning, 
you know, this guy meeting with these individuals over here and these other things happening together, that's when I know, hey, this is something that I probably should pay attention to. So one of the things for this particular thing, the lack of contextual information that Variato does, and, uh, and, and by the way, I'm not a Variato employee, you know, I'm, I'm doing these, these, these webinars for them. But one of the things they do is they, they establish, first of all, with their product Variato uh, Recon, they establish what normal user behavior is supposed to look like, okay? They take those user activity logs, they create them on the local machine, and they look at activity that's occurring and store it for up to 30 days. So you can go back and take a look at this and see what is the behavior that's been happening, what's going on that I can look at. And then those activity logs are going to provide them with a comprehensive record. I say them, you, with a comprehensive record of everything that that user did before, during, and after alert occurred. So it's not just um, the machine saying there's a package. It's what the heck is Derek doing there at 3 in the morning? And why did he come back next week at 3 in the morning? What is going on? That can be legitimate. I could be there doing a special assignment. But at least you've been alerted to it. At least you know, and now you can come take a better look at it. Okay? Another one, security tools yield, yield too many false positives I talked about. A lot of organizations get more than 10,000 alerts every month. And 52% of those alerts are false positives, 52%. Isn't that wasting a lot of your time? Do you want your time wasted? I think not. I don't want my time wasted. 64% of those alerts are redundant. And guess what happens with redundancy? We become complacent. Ah, I've seen that before. It's nothing. Ah, I've seen that before. It's nothing. It's like crying wolf. And then finally, that wolf is really going to show up and I won't see it because ah, I've seen that before. It means nothing. Now, I can analyze this. Well, with this tool, organizations can analyze, can only analyze 50% of daily alerts. I'm sorry, this is what they normally can do. This is another challenge that they have. Now, let me tell you how we can fix this. So that Variato Recon analyzes that user behavior and isolates those anomalies. All that stuff that I say, ah, I've seen it before and I'm not paying attention to it, they're going to isolate that. And when that anomalous behavior is outside of some predetermined limits that we've already discovered, determined, and put into this, this product, they're going to immediately send out relevant alerts that work that I'm going to really look at and tell me something is going wrong. And they're going to be generated in a prioritized, um, you know, based on indicators of compromise. As it says here, not every event that takes place within the IT system is a bad event. It's going to look at it, aggregate it, and give me the ones that I should pay attention to. Look at some other another challenge. Okay, um, behavior involved with the incident are consistent with the user's roles and responsibilities. I work nine to five. I'm there nine to five, so you see no problem, right? It says 54 percent of managers say that detecting insider attack is harder today than it was in 2011. Even if, if your network users have no ill intent, negligence and compromised credentials are just as dangerous as somebody actually breaking in and doing a theft. So what can we do about that? So Recon applies machine learning. Remember I mentioned that earlier when I told you about um, UBA? They take machine learning and advanced statistical analysis that I mentioned earlier to detect changes in user behavior that's indicative of insider threat. They say, oh, this is something that Derek should look at. It also alerts on keywords and phrase usage that are proven indicators of threat activity. Remember I told you in fraud indicators, I'm looking at what people say, you know, what people are doing, what they're saying about their activity, what they're putting in emails. Remember, I mentioned social media. So now it's taking those and looking at it and putting it against proven indicators of that threat activity. And then it's analyzing that user behavior. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, we just lost Derek, so hold on just a second. We'll see if we can get him back. So sit tight just for a moment. I'll be, uh, be certain we're going to try and get, reach out to him and see if we can get him right back on the phone. Hold on just a second.
we're still connecting uh, Derek back into the webcast. Give us just another moment. We'll be, uh, be continuing on in just a second. So it looks like from the slides that you can see in front of you, and you know that here, actually Derek's calling me right now, everyone, hold on just two seconds, and we're going to get him back on. Not back, huh? Okay, all right, will do, all right. We can hear you now, Derek. Okay, you got me back? Yeah, we got you back. I don't know what happened there. All right. Sorry about that. Don't know what happened. <laughs> Best laid plans. So I'm going to get through this um, quickly so I can give it because we lost a couple of minutes there. But as I was saying, um, I don't know where I, where you lost me. If you saw what I talked about, about um, users' roles and responsibilities, but I'm going to jump here. More data than we can do with. I told you there's thousands of alerts. Organization, I can only investigate 50% of those, 56%, and it takes a human to do that, which means it takes a lot of time and ability to do that. So with Recon, I can augment those traditional um, data loss prevention tools that I have and other preventive security measures that I have. I can watch for changes in that data access and the movement around my network that people are doing, and they create a system of records that support best security practices for fixing these things. Okay. All right, so actually, I was just about done there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to, to Jack, and Jack is going to give you a demonstration of how this tool works and the great things it can do to, for you in order to um, mitigate some of the things that I talked about during my webinar. So Jack, are you ready for it, my friend? Yes, sir. Thank you. Right. Maybe I can take presenter role. Ah, here sure. we go. Ah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Able to see? We see you, Jack. Great. I appreciate the intro, Derek. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Jack, by the way, and uh, I work for Variato. I'm an engineer here, and I'm going to be talking briefly about two of our products uh, that Derek mentioned earlier, Variato Recon and also Variato 360, and those products can assist you in detecting data leakage and determining uh, exactly what may have happened. I'll also be showing you how those two products work together. Right now what we're looking at is the configuration for a Windows recording policy. The policy configuration screen, as you can see, allows you to define how and what to record on a client computer that you're monitoring with Variato 360 uh, and or Variato Recon. You can create as few or as many recording policies as you'd like. You may wish to monitor the majority of your organization's users one way while setting up a more aggressive recording policy for your more high-risk employees, for example. As you can see, we're able to monitor which websites your users visit. We can tell you how much time they're spending on those websites. Also, email conversations and chat and IM conversations can be monitored too as well as files transferred from websites or FTP servers, and also document tracking events, which allows you to easily monitor information about new files that are created or existing files that are modified, deleted, renamed, or printed on either local drives, network drives, uh, locally synced cloud storage folders for Google Drive, Microsoft OneDrive or Dropbox, as well as removable uh, USB drives. Keystrokes your users type can also be monitored as well as screenshots, which can uh, be taken at a predefined interval or when specifically defined events occur. And these screenshots are great because they can add much needed context around any other activities that are taking place on the computer. You may, for example, see that a user transferred this file to removable storage or transferred it to Dropbox. And if you can look at the screenshots and see what happened before that activity took place, it might be able to help you understand why the user uh, did what they did. 
uh, when a lot of times that uh, information is not as readily available in, in the logs that told you that the user did this, so it can help you certainly understand why the user may have done that. Both Variato Recon and Variato 360 uh, record the exact same information. The key difference between the two products, however, is what is done with the data that is captured. With Variato Recon, the data is stored safely and privately on the client computer for the last 30 days, and nobody's able to see that data during that time. Metadata that describes the activity sent back to the server so that Variato Recon can analyze the data and determine what activities are normal for the user, as Derek was describing earlier, and then it can begin to detect shifts in that behavior and alert you when those anomalous activities are detected. Variato Recon is also able to scan for and detect the use of specified keywords and phrases and alert you to those as well. When a computer is being recorded with Variato 360, on the other hand, the data that's associated with the monitored activities is sent from the client to the server as quickly as possible, making that data ready for review and investigation inside this Variato management console. It's important to note that each computer can be monitored with either Variato 360 or Variato Recon or both at the same time uh, if you'd like. So once you have Variato Recon uh, deployed to your client computers and it's had time to determine a level of activity that's normal for your users, you'll begin to receive alerts. Uh, I've got a picture of one here, uh, such as this one, and that may indicate an unusually high level of document tracking activity in this case. Uh, for a user named Tara O'Sullivan. Uh, this alert by itself may be enough for me to begin an investigation of Tara O'Sullivan's activities, or uh, I might combine the receipt of this alert with other alerts, or uh, for example, the knowledge that Tara, who occupies a high-risk position with, within my organization, she's decided to leave and go work for a competitor. So this information combined with that information tells me that uh, I may want to uh, investigate Tara's activities. So in any case, if you decide you want to switch to investigation mode, so to speak, you simply apply a standard or a floating Variato 360 license to Terra's computer, and within a few minutes, you'll have the details of all of Terra's activities for the last 30 days, and then you will continue to receive new activity detail for as long as necessary uh, to conclude your investigation. So once I've unlocked the Variato Recon data on Terra's computer, it's made available, as I said, for review in the Management Console. There are several different ways to review the data inside the Management Console, but right now we're going to look at the 360 uh, dashboard section up here. As you'll see, we have a series of folders that are, most of these are pre-built in the software when you initially install it, and they contain various charts depicting your user's activities. I've actually custom built this particular folder here, and it contains uh, charts that are built specifically for my investigation of Tara and one of her colleagues, Frank. The chart on the upper left, for example, shows uh, these users' document tracking events broken down by the type of device that the uh, activity took place on. The green bar here next to Tara O'Sullivan, for example, represents activities that took place on a removable USB drive. These charts are fully customizable. You can change the look and feel, the scope of them if you want to, so you can uh, change the criteria around to depict certain specific activities if you want to, but they're also interactive. So I can click the green segment on the bar and a data explorer opens, allowing me to see the data uh, or the details associated with these particular activities that that chart depicts. As I look through the details of Tara's activities on the removable drive, I can see the date and time of the event, I can see which computer it occurred on, the activity, uh, in this case these are files that she created, I can see the drive, the path, and the file name of the file in question, and if I want any additional context around these activities, I can always click the View Screen Snapshots button over here in the far right column, and that'll show me the screenshot that was taken on Tara's computer nearest to the time that this particular event was recorded. So once the snapshot viewer opens, I'm able to use DVR-like controls up here on the upper left to move forward and backward and see everything that was taking place on Terra's computer before, during, and after the event in question occurred. So as I watch Terra copy the files to her removal drive, I also notice a troubling Skype conversation that's taking place uh, with her colleague Frank. 
excuse me. Variato 360's recorded this entire Skype conversation, which makes it very easy for me to quickly review its contents and determine whether or not there may have been any collusion or other inappropriate activity. In this case, there was, and the Skype conversation helped me to understand why Terra actually copied those files to the removable storage. If the investigation results in your needing to turn over any of the recorded information to a third party, such as your organization's human resources department or uh, outside legal counsel, uh, you do have the ability to easily export any data into formats that can be viewed outside of the very auto management console. I do appreciate you all taking time to allow me to quickly demonstrate only a very small portion of Variato Recons and Variato 360's functionality. If you'd like to see more, please do let us know. We'd be happy to spend some time with you for a personalized one-on-one -on -one demo. But at this time, I'm going to turn it back over to Nick, who's going to address any questions we may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack. So uh, I'm running through these a couple of these questions we've got here. Remember to put some uh, questions if you have any into the Q&A box in your control panel here. And um, there's a couple of questions that have come in. And um, uh, what was these? So Joseph is asking, and this is probably for you, Derek. It says, "What was the?" Uh, it says SATE, S-A-T-E. I'm assuming that you meant state, Joseph. But what was the state of the patrol case study? I'm not sure. Is that something that you covered? in your presentation, Daryl, the patrol case study? I think it means payroll, the payroll one. It might have been a typo. Oh, it says it says PAT. Oh, maybe, it says it, uh, maybe it is payroll. That, maybe that's the way it got even better there. So is it uh, the payroll case study? Was there a particular state that was in, Derek, that you're aware of? Um, um, I have. Let me. I have, I have to look at my notes. I can't remember which, which one, but I can't get it to you. You want to make sure that he gets that information. Because um, you said what state. I didn't know if you mean what was the result of it or where did it take place, but I can get you that information. Yeah, Joseph, if you give us a little more context on your question, that might help as well. Um, while you're doing that, Jack, question to you from Boris. Boris says, do you monitor USB hardware keylogger events? Um, we, we are able to capture keystrokes, but uh, we do not have a way to detect whether a keylogger is attached to a computer. Another keylogger, of course, other than our software, that would uh, be something that I believe would be best left to your anti-malware uh, solution. Okay, he's actually li even listing a very specific do a dongle, a Wi-Fi premium hardware keylogger, uh, uh, and he's, he's listing that out here as well. So maybe, if nothing else, maybe Boris Jack can get a hold of you after the webinar, take a look at the specific one you're talking about, and see if he can get you uh, an answer there as well. Um, Joyce asks, uh, and actually I think this is for you, Jack, says, how does the amount of data that you're collecting affect system performance? Uh, that's a great question. One of our primary goals when we are developing and continuing, of course, to develop our agent uh, and all of its features and functionality is to uh, make the uh, agent as, um, as invisible as possible, right, both visually and as far as performance goes. It runs in stealth mode by default, and so anything that could uh, affect the performance or the visibility of the of the software, uh, we make our best effort to avoid. So very rarely uh, do we ever see c scenarios where um, a customer is having any type of uh, performance impact from the uh, recording agent. That's a great question, but it is something we uh, focus a whole lot of effort on so that it uh, impacts the performance as little as possible. It's generally completely unnoticeable. Hey, Nick, and that company was in Chicago. It's called Assisted Living Concepts, and it's in Chicago, Illinois. Wonderful. I figured that would give you enough time. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Vladin is asking, it's sort of a comment and a question It looks like a little bit together. He's talking about the, the with regard to position of employees' rights inside of an organization, and this is probably for you, Derek. It says, what if corporations enforced full-spectrum domination over individual employees and their behavior with IT resources? I'm going to maybe uh, ex extrapolate a little bit out of that. Is that even possible? Have you seen that done? I, I, you know, I think full-spectrum domination isn't exactly an industry term, but maybe you can take an interpretation of that. Well, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say you have an expectation of privacy. So I, I'm, I'm taking that as you're taking that person's privacy away, away from them, right, in the organization. Well, they work for the company, and we're not going to just target individuals. We're not just going to watch everybody and everything that they do. As we talked about, there's going to be anomalies that we look for. We're going to, we're going to aggregate all the different things that's happening, right? But it's going to be based on an alert. 
So if we find that Derek is, again, coming in at 3 in the morning and Derek shouldn't be there, that's an alert. So now we're going to start paying more attention. It's just like wiretapping a phone. We're not going to wiretap everybody, but if we have cause to believe something happened, then we're going to ask for a wiretap. I think that's kind of how it's going to work so that everyone won't be just arbitrarily affected by this. Okay. Perfect. And then um, Joseph has got two, two kind of a two-part question here, and it has a lot to do with um, uh, common criteria, of course, which is a common criteria for um, information technology security evaluations. And he's wondering, um, uh, he's talking about a little comparing the security you're talking about to common criteria. He says he was asking originally. This came in at the very beginning of the webcast. Are you going to compare? these security measures to common criteria, so maybe you can at least address a little bit about that if you can. And then also is, is asked, wondering, is, is this giving the ability to achieve um, EAL, which is Evaluation Assurance Level 7, uh, it's a numerical grade assigning the, the completion of the common criteria security evaluation. So well, any well, commentary uh, on, on there, Derek? Yeah, I got a little bit of commentary. So when, with common criteria, one of the things they're talking about is being able to monitor events and monitor activity in your organization. And I think that's where UBA falls into play. I can monitor third-party activity. I can monitor exfiltration of sensitive data. I can detect the use of compromised credentials. I can prevent the misuse of high, high privilege accounts. So yes, it's falling into some of the measures that you will find in the common criteria for protecting your organization. It works hand in hand with those. Um, the second part, I can't quite remember the second part, oh, EAL. So yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, I'm not sure if it helps you meet level seven. I can't remember what that is, but I know it's the highest level. So by monitoring and, and, and preventing um, illicit access to your resources in the first place, it's going to help you increase your security posture mm -hmm. and therefore help you inc uh, increase security and reach those higher levels, be EAL or any other, other evaluation criteria that you use. Perfect. It looks like uh, the one last question, and we're going to go because we're already two minutes after the hour, but we want to make sure we're trying to get as many as you, you, questions as we can here. Um, this is uh, AB is the name of the, the person here. They want to know, uh, very audit is key logging. Doesn't that give access to all typed passwords to all engineers who have access to the very auto console? Uh, Jack, thoughts on that? Sure, that's a great question. So we do have functionality in the software that allows you to tell it not to record passwords. And the software, of course, will make its best effort to determine what is a password and what isn't and uh, not record it if it can determine it's a password. Also, when you grant access to the console to other users, maybe HR employees or legal uh, teams or supervisors, for example, you can control what uh, activities they have access to review. So you can have it mask any detected passwords. Uh, you can have it completely prevent someone from seeing keystrokes if you don't want them to see it. So you do have the ability to control access to uh, what types of information can be viewed within the console. All right, perfect. So it sounds like I think we've answered all the questions that were out there today. Um, we, everyone on the, the call today, we really appreciate your attendance today um, and your questions as well. Jack, thanks for a great demo. Derek, as always, you. you are never without words. Thank you for participating. And, uh, and with that, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and finish today's webinar, and we'll catch you guys all in the next webcast. So thanks for your attendance. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.